Um, I'm happy to introduce Sander Gilman, followed by Val Valentina Pisanti, and a Q&A discussion afterwards, moderated by me. Remembering, ladies and gentlemen, is always fragmentary, is always inchoate. Remembering has its own pitfalls. And while, according to Paul Recoeur, it, remembering may be a moral duty, it's never a pleasant one. Friedrich Nietzsche in The Use and Abuse of History argued that remembering is being able to selectively to forget the totality of the past and thus shape it into a system useful for what he calls life, our quotidian existence. Thus, if a collective, a state, a community seems to remember, it is only through fragmented, inchoate symbols cobbled together in the very act of remembering that continually distorts and reinvents individual memory. Nor are all post-memory images or tales redemptive in their, and I here I quote, uh, Marianne Hirsch, relationship that that generation after bears to the personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who came before. Indeed, many are corrosive and destructive, dismissive of that which has come before. All memory is ideological. All memory is Whiggish, that it is driven by the desire in the now to make sense not of the past, but of the present, and therefore predictive of the future. The Stanford comparatist Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht evokes the now as being between the past that engulfs us and the menacing future where the present has turned into a dimension of expanding simultaneities. It is an age of ever greater intensity, seemingly today driven by the new media, by the global internet and its plethora of fragments, true or invented. Gombrich continues, the new present is one in which all paradigms and phenomena for the past are juxtaposed as being available and ready to hand. For this present, instead of leaving the past behind, is inundated with pastness, and at the same time is facing a future which, instead of being an open horizon of possibility, seems occupied by threats that are inevitably moving towards us. Think of global warming, he says, as an example. But of course, any good commentator in the age of Luther and movable type, in the age of S.F.B. Morris and the Telegraph, in the age of Joseph Pulitzer and the Bergenthal typesetting machine, in the age of Charles Chaplin and the cinema, in the age of Josef Goebbels and the radio, would have said the exact same thing about their now and the intensity new to them and their compatriots of the availability of the fragments of the past in their now. It is not so much the medium that is the message as we constitute memory. Rather, it is the novelty of an excess of information, or at least the seeming excess as measured against our earlier experiences. Those of us who decades ago worked in newspaper morgues, a phrase, by the way, that may not be familiar to many of you, huge collections of newspaper clippings systematically ordered by topics in tens of thousands of file drawers. Those of us who spent weeks and months there are overwhelmed today not only by the speed of Nexus and Lexus online, but by its seeming global reach. For many in the now, this is the new norm. When I was invited to present this talk, my trajectory was clear and relatively unambiguous. 
The Holocaust was chatted out online only in times of exigency, when all other rhetorical flourishes failed. This is Godwin's law, that the longer an online discussion grows, regardless of topic or scope, the probability of a comparison to Nazis or Hitler was inevitable. And then came Vladimir Putin and the Nazis in Ukraine. Maria Zarkova, the Russian foreign ministry spokesman, stated at the very beginning of the invasion that the roots of Nazism in Ukraine reached deep into the past centuries, crippling many of the noble and free souls of the people of little Russia, by which she means, of course, Ukraine. Saving the Ukrainians from their Nazi leaders became the mantra repeated by some leaders of the right and the left well behind Russia. They evoked the Banderists as a synonym for Ukrainian Nazis, lumping together pre- and post-war nationalists and anti-Semites, and indeed, even contemporary Jewish political leaders. For as the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, said, some of the worst anti-Semites are Jews. Elsewhere, the question was raised as to who were actually the Nazis. In Israel, a protester in Tel Aviv held up a poster of Russian President Vladimir Putin ornamented with a Hitler mustache. As people gathered to watch Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky in a video addressed at the Knesset on March the 20th, 2022. What they heard was Zelensky evoking the Nazis and the Holocaust to what, have been his, what should have been his best audience for this parallel. I quote Zelensky. When the Nazi party raided Europe and wanted to destroy everything, they called it the final solution to the Jewish question. You remember that, he says to the Israelis at the Knesset, and I'm sure you will never forget. But listen to what is sounding now in Moscow. Hear how these words are said again, final solution, but already in relation, so to speak, to us, to the Ukrainian issue. The very next day, Dani Dayan, the chair of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Center, said Zelensky must apologize. Let's make a clear differentiation between the Russian invasion, which is deplorable, and apparently there are a lot of actions taken by the Russian army that are apparently beyond the pale, <laughs> and historical comparisons, the wrong historical equivalences that President Zelensky made, especially his reference to the final solution. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can note that many politicians in Israel and elsewhere since the Russian invasion seem to have their own decent Russian oligarch. A week or so earlier, Dani Dayen, among others, said that sanctioning Putin's great friend Roman Abramovich would be both unfair and negatively impact Israel and the Jewish world, as Abramovich had made a multi-million shekel donation the week before, I quote, that will significantly strengthen Yad Vashem's mission. Better or worse than Zelensky? Who is the Nazi? Who is the Jew? This is not a recent or a unique moment. In 1950, Soon after the founding of the Bundesrepublik and at the very beginning of the Cold War, Hannah Arendt, whose work, by the way, we have recently been admonished to reread in the light of the new authoritarianism. Many of us have been reading Hannah Arendt a long time. By the way, it took me a long time to find this picture of her smiling. It is the scariest damn picture I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Hannah Arendt mused that the sight of Germany's destroyed cities and the knowledge of German concentration camps and extermination camps have covered Europe with a cloud of melancholy. This is 1950. Together, they have made the memory of the last war more poignant and more persistent, the fear of future wars more actual, the nightmare of Germany and its physical, moral, and political ruin has become almost as a decisive an element in the general atmosphere of European life as the communist movements. The nightmare of the Holocaust, a word in 1950 not yet in common circulation, is for her of equal weight 
with the images of bombed out Berlin and Dresden in her now in 1950, to signal that such a past cannot, should not ever be imaginable again. By the time the term Holocaust becomes common coin, let's use 1958 when the American television show by that name is shown, or the year after when it's shown in Germany in the Bundesrepublik. Um, a Holocaust had become, I quote, a free floating signifier ready to be filled with shifting meaning depending on the exigencies of the historical moment, as Michael Butter observed in 2009. Reduced to victim versus perpetrator, good versus evil, or any other set of platitudinous dichotomies as needed. But we have to remember that the children in Anna Freud's Hampstead clinics in the early 1940s, rescued from the bombings in the Jewish and the non-Jewish East End, or brought to England on the Kindertransporten, played a version of cowboys and Indians. They played Jews and Nazis, and all of the kids wanted to be Nazis. The Holocaust, according to Gabriel Rosenfeld in 2015, had been, since the 1970s, reduced to, and again I quote, tendentious purposes that threatens to drain it of much of its historical distinctiveness and turn it into an empty signifier. Once upon a time, he says, Hitler and the Nazis were viewed as abolishing symbols of extremity. Today, their ubiquity has lent them an aura of normality. But perhaps this too is not new. Today, as Susan and Stephanie both have said, this is linked to an ideology of victimhood that allows movements to position themselves as always being defensive and always reacting to aggression coming from the opposing side. Today, everybody wants to be a Jew, much the opposite of Anna Freud's child patients. The specificities of the Holocaust, also created only over time by various symbolic communities, seems to vanish, but its symbolic contours, zombie-like, never do. By 2021, COVID-19 forced Western societies to seek out analogies for the fear and the isolation of the new plague. What was interesting to me was that there was suddenly a, an unbelievable interest in Shakespeare, over 10,000 citation in Lexus and Nexus to Shakespeare and the plague appeared. But not surprisingly, so did the Holocaust. Those at a demonstration in Cologne in September of 2020 saw a 63-year-old woman arrested for wearing a Judenstern with the claim that being unvaccinated placed her and others in the position of the Jews after 1941. She was accused of having compared the public health mandates of the German government to the Holocaust and thereby having, and this is a wonderful phrase, trivialized history in seinem Unrechtsgehalt bagelitisiert. And this became a litmus test, not only in the BRD, but through social media globally. These yellow stars appeared in demonstrations in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, as part of political discourses and imagery among those opposed to the various mandates for what they considered to be an invented pandemic. By the way, no one ever asked the microbes about their opinion about its own reality. <laughs> that some countries, for good or for ill, as we'll hear over the next few days, had so-called memory laws, seem to have had no impact on this image of the unvaccinated as victims. And for those wearing the stars, by the way, like this lady in Cologne, it was not trivialization. Victimhood became the defining quality of the Holocaust across the COVID-ridden world. And not the dead and the dying, but those refusing to acknowledge the daily reality surrounding them became the true victims. Now, I know that our topic is the right wing and the Holocaust. 
But you also need to choose your politics when you address the instrumentalization of the Holocaust. In February of 2021, Pierce Corbin, the 73-year-old brother of the former labor leader, Jeremy Corbin, was arrested on suspicion, and these are the terms, suspicion of malicious communications and public nuisance over leaf leaflets comparing the co UK's COVID-19 vaccine rollout to Auschwitz. The gates of the camp were reconfigured to argue against vaccination. I am of an age that saw the inadvertently upside down pink triangles of ACT UP and Larry Kramer during the HIV pandemics of the 1980s. Kramer had argued that Ronald Reagan and his administration was, and here I quote, equal to Hitler and his Nazi doctors performing their murderous experiments in the camps, not because of simple, similar intentions, but because of similar results. And by the way, Anthony S. Fauci, then as now head of the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease, was, in Kramer's rhetoric, equal to the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann. He didn't escape this label in 2021, but by then he had become Josef Mengele. In Israeli society, as my colleague Nadav Davidovich at Ben Gurion University wrote, the Holocaust and Nazi medicine are the benchmark for collective trauma, and thus they can be used to shift the traditional power balance. In other words, they can serve to historicize public health interventions and policies along the continuum from normal to Nazi medicine, or from public health to eugenics. In Israel, who were the Nazis and who were the Jews during COVID-19? The state epidemiologist Hagai Lavin said that, and I quote, he had received phone calls and comments online in which he was compared to the Nazi war criminal Josef Mengele, who had performed medical experiments on humans. Dr. Sharon Alroy Price, the health ministry's head of public health, reported these attacks go to some very dark places murder, hanging, doing bad things to my children, comparisons to the Nazis. There's no end to it. Not that far from Larry Kramer and AIDS. In Israel, by the end of 2021, groups, including the so-called Anshe Emet Fellowship, filed a charge with the International Criminal Court in The Hague, claiming a violation of the Nuremberg Code and the resultant idea of informed consent, resulting, of course, from the doctor's trial in 1947, where, by the way, Josep Mengele was not on trial because he was lying already on a beach in Paraguay. Evoking the Israeli patients' rights law, they claimed that the early arrangement of the Netanyahu government, which included, of course, the ultra-religious parties, one of whose members was, mem was the Minister of Health, with pharmaceutical companies such as Pfizer, as proof of the violation of the Nuremberg Code, as well as Israeli law. And here I quote from the petition. As he will receive a huge quantity of millions of vaccine portions, and with a preference over other countries in consideration, the vaccinated, the residents of Israel, will serve as experimenters for the pharmaceutical company. It was agreed that the pharmaceutical company would receive from Israel all their medical, personal, secret information without their knowledge or consent in advance. Israel is Auschwitz, Netanyahu is Mengele, who then are the Nazis, who then are the Jews. Some of you may remember Wednesday, January the 6th, 2021 when for the first time in the history of the United States, the civil transmission of power from one administration to the other was brutally interrupted by a mass insurrection against the federal government fomented by the then president of the United States. May his name be damned forever, Donald Trump. The invaders stormed the U.S. Capitol, carrying flags. 
among them the Q flag, QAnon, the conspiracy flag, with its anti-Semitic overtones. Let me drop overtones with its anti-Semitic messages. The American flag, and of course, the flag of Israel. In the crowd fomented by Trump, Haredi Jews with payas mixed with individuals wearing Camp Auschwitz Work Brings Freedom sweatshirts. In the Capitol, Dr. Simone Gold, an emergency room physician self-labeled as a balat shuva, one who had returned to being Jewish, was an active part of the insurrection. What was she doing? She was lecturing the mob having entered the rotunda, surrounded by mar marauding, marauding rioters, spreading, by the way, blood and feces on the walls of the Capitol about the pernicious effects of vaccination against COVID-19, subsequently charged with entering a restricted building, violent entering, entry, and disorderly conduct. She became a heroine of the anti-vax movement, as well as the Trump camp, arguing that not only had the election been stolen, been stolen by people who had made up COVID-19. These concepts fitted seamlessly into her now, into the symbolic re register. But so did her new religious identity. Right? A year later, Simen Gold suddenly evokes the Nazis now. This is on March the 24th, 2022, as anti-Torah. I quote from her speech. We can understand the truth of Nazism. So when the science does not accord with the Torah, as they are telling you now, tell the scientists to go back to the drawing board. When the propagandists fill you with fear, tell them you reject their words. Human freedom is in more jeopardy, in my opinion, today even than in 1940, because evildoers' most enduring weapon is propaganda, and unlike 90, 1940, today propaganda has swept the entire globe. The world has been, according to her, manipulating, manipulated into thinking that there was a pandemic because the science that the public health authorities followed did not comport with her admittedly amateur understanding of Tanakh, of Torah. In Israel, the person who clearly did understand Tanakh was the late Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, known as the Prince of Torah, the dean of the so-called Lithuanian Jews, the Litvaks, a non-Hasidic sect of ultra-Orthodox Jews who form roughly a third of the Haredim in Israel. His views on the interpretation of Torah were undebatable. When the pandemic began, he virulently opposed any closures of religious institutions, of schools, of synagogues, coming up directly against the Netanyahu state mandated lockdowns. And by the way, in spite of a massive spike of cases in his community. Hans Zichermann, the academic director of the ultra-Orthodox campus of the Ono Academic College observed at the moment that this was the first time in the history of the state of Israel that the Haredim simply said clearly and unevocally, we do not care what the law says, we are not going to obey. And the rabbi's position became a running joke on Israeli TV. On the equivalent of Saturday Night Lives, um, the political sat satirical show, Eretz de Hadaret, an actor dressed as the rabbi was asked, and he was very deaf in his old age, asked loudly whether he saw the opponents to his position opposing the government's mandates at merely as koferim, as heretics, or were they really Nazis? Soon after, by the way, with a clear increase in morbidity and mortality in his own community, Kanievsky changed his views about the public's health. 
By June 2020, he advocated mask wearing. In December 2020, when vaccines, because of Netanyahu's arrangements with Pfizer, became available in Israel, stated that getting vaccinated was a religious obligation. Simon Gold or Chaim Kanievsky? Who are the Nazis? Who are the Jews? How are these concepts now melded into symbolic systems that have little or nothing to do with Nazis or with Jews, except for the power to focus our attention not on the question of the Holocaust, but on the network of meanings now fitted tightly around this almost empty signifier? This will be the stuff of what I know will be a controversial, contested few days of conversation here in the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, as we too constitute the Holocaust in the politics of our now. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen.